Hi everyone, my name is Carson Whitenauer and I serve as the Executive Director for Uncommon Pursuit where we are equipping Christians to participate in God's mission. And as part of that today, I am thrilled to feature Glenn Scrivener. He is the director of Speak Life UK, and he is the author of a book called The Air We Breathe. I, I read it this summer. I loved it. I reached out to Glenn to see if he would join the program and share with us about this book. He very kindly agreed, and I'm thrilled to have him on the program today. So as we prepare to discuss The Air We Breathe, I wanted to start with the person behind the book, the lungs behind the air. And so, Glenn, if you would please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and your story. Take some time to fill us in on what brought you from little baby Glenn to the author of The Air We Breathe. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Carson. Uh, so I grew up in Australia, and I uh, have lived more than half my life now in the UK. So give or take the odd deportation, it's mainly been uh, England for me uh, for the last sort of 20 years. And uh, I grew up in a church-going home, and uh, I was the good boy, I guess, in the youth groups and the Bible studies, and I would have my hand in the air, and I'd, I'd answer Jesus to all the questions, and that seemed to keep people happy. And that was what I was interested in, uh, keeping people happy. Uh, but I was a sort of teenager, and I went along to the sort of Christian camps that told you to give your life to Jesus constantly. And so I did give my life to Jesus constantly. And I, I think I probably gave my life to Jesus a thousand times in, in my teenage years, starting from about age 13, I think every day until I was 18. I would give my life in ever more dramatic ways. And my, my big sort of verse when I was a teenager, it was the Garden of Gethsemane, that, that, that part of the Bible where Jesus is the night before he dies and he's wrestling in prayer with his Father, whether he will yield himself, whether he will say, your will be done uh, to God. And he's sweating blood, and it's, it's very melodramatic. And it, and it sort of, um, it appealed to teenage Glenn, who thought that Christianity was basically, what would Jesus do? And I thought, well, what would Jesus do? Jesus would yield his life to God in melodramatic ways. And that's what I did. And I would even, as a teenager, uh, volunteer to walk the dog into scary areas of the, the, the woods near my house because that's what Jesus did. And I would press my face into the dirt because that's what Jesus did. And I would say, your will be done because that's what Jesus did. And I was constantly giving my life to God. Uh, and about... After a thousand prayers, I uh, I probably gave up on thinking that God actually wanted me, and hmm. um, and so I didn't want Him, and I went away to to university, went away to to college uh, to have as good a time as I possibly could without God, and um, I sort of succeeded and sort of failed, and what brought me back really was a totally different understanding of who is God. Um, a, a friend of mine challenged me to read through the Gospels with him. And after three years of walking away from church, I, I suddenly said yes. And we got to the Garden of Gethsemane and there is Jesus yielding up his life in prayer. And I said to my friend, I can't handle this passage. I can't be like Jesus. And my friend said, do you think you're Jesus, Glenn? I was like, well, not in every respect, but... Um, he said, no, Glenn, you're, you're not Jesus. You are Peter in that story. And for those who don't know the story, Jesus invites Peter to pray with him, and Peter is not up to it. Peter falls asleep. Peter fails, and Jesus prays for him. And my friend said, that's who you are. You're Peter. You're not Jesus. And Jesus does it all for you. It's not your, your life yielded to God. It's Christ's life yielded to you and for you. And it just flipped everything on its head. I was at the time studying philosophy, and um, I've always loved big ideas, and I remember coming to the end of studying philosophy at Oxford University, and you would just, you would think that um, I'd gotten to the heart of reality, and, and yet I was sort of reacquainting myself with Jesus, and I was looking at my studies, and I was listening to a lot of music, and I, I, I remember listening to um, the uh, the Blues Brothers soundtrack. Nice. <laughs> in particular, Good choice. Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, right? 
on repeat. And I was thinking, actually, I was studying a course that was meant to take me through the, the greats of Western philosophy. And had we gotten to that, everybody needs somebody to love. Hmm. And I picked up a book by Colin Gunton, who's a, a Christian theologian, who also did a his history of Western philosophy. And he showed how the triune God actually answers the questions that the great philosophers down through the ages have always been asking. And of course, love is the greatest thing because God, the greatest thing is love. And that was starting to make intellectual sense just as it made emotional sense for me as I was reading through the gospels and encountering Christ in that sort of way. And so I guess ever since then, which is about 20 years ago, ever since then, I've been trying to unite heart and head and trying to see whether the intuitions I have about love being the greatest thing mm -hmm. are actually met in the scriptures and in the, in the person of Jesus. And I've totally found that to be the case. And now I'm an ordained minister in the Church of England and I'm trying to introduce other people to Jesus. And I'm, find, I'm finding more and more what is useful is to point to the values, the intuitions, the loves that my friends already have. Mm -hmm. And to match that together with the person of Jesus and to say the, the kindness that you love and the, 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 the sense of equality that you already love, the sense of human rights and human value and human dignity that you already love. Um, there is actually a person behind all that that's shaping that, that is grounding that. And I want you through those loves through those intuitions to discover the person behind it and you could do that in a quite philosophical way and and sometimes i do it that way you could do that in a scriptural way by taking people through the bible and I, i've done both of those things but i guess in this book i'm doing it in a historical way mm -hmm. and showing how concretely the person of jesus and his re revolution have in fact given us these moral intuitions about equality and compassion and all those other things so there's there's the journey in in a five minute ramble no it wasn't a ramble at all it really helps me to connect to you and to the book to see that this is a, a personal journey that you've been on and we do have a, a sliver of connection there i did a study abroad at saint cats and uh, was a member okay. of the jcr there for two terms and those were huh. six of the happiest months of my life uh, just the charm of Oxford and uh, the chance to engage with very challenging philosophy and wrestling through myself. I came to Oxford as a Christian, but one of the tutorials I took was informally named the best atheistic arguments against Christianity because I figured, hmm. you know, I don't want to be a Christian unless this is true and unless uh, this can be validated with some kind of reason. And so... I found your book very interesting because of the way it was so concretely historical and traced things through from, uh, well, so often you start in the present day in a, a controversy we're facing and then tracing uh, some of the values that are spurring that controversy on all the way back to the person of Jesus. But uh, Glenn, um, I told you beforehand I wanted to ask uh, some challenging questions. And so one philosopher to another, um, I want to try and poke some holes in your book. And... Um, you start off at the very beginning of your book. You say, here's the contention of this book. If you're a Westerner, whether you stepped foot inside a church or not, whether you've clapped eyes on a Bible or not, whether you consider yourself an atheist, pagan, or Jedi Knight, you are a goldfish, and Christianity is the water in which you swim. And I love the idea of thinking of myself as a goldfish in a fishbowl. Um, you know, very um, uh, kind of to your readers in that in that regard. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what I wanted to, to push you on is, you know, someone saying, I'm an atheist. I reject Jesus. I reject Christianity. I was hurt by the church. I don't like the Bible. I think it's regressive. We need to move on from it as soon as possible. And here you are, a public Christian saying, actually, you're still kind of Christian. And I, I wonder, Glenn, if some people are going to feel that that's arrogant, it's imperialistic, you're shoving religion down their throats with this book. And so I wanted to press you on that and ask for your response. Well, I, I wonder whether goldfish feel like water has been shoved down their throats too, <laughs> or, or whether breathers feel like air is being shoved down their throats. Okay. Um, I, I guess it's, it's either true or it's not. Mm. 
that our moral intuitions are contingent on the society that we've grown up in and are surrounded by, and that history shapes us in a way that is inescapable. And I, I hope that all of us can, can recognize that we are located in time and space and that there are societal values that are around us and there are historical forces that stretch back into the past over which we, we have no say. Um, and may, maybe that's part of the, the challenge. Maybe that's part of what sounds so outrageous is that I'm saying, no, no, we are located. We're located in a, a story that is far bigger than us and we are not the rational creatures that we think we are. Hmm that we are not assessing the truth from nowhere, but we are very contingent beings. We are biological beings. We are familial beings. We are cultural beings. We are historical beings. And we are not blank slates. Hmm. And, and so that, that's what I'm really trying to say. And most of the, most of the people um, who I cite in the book who make a similar thesis are not Christians. Hmm. There are people like Joseph Henrik, who you know, was a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard University, who wrote a fantastic book and, and a fascinating book called The Weirdest People in the World. And he points to the West and he says, us Westerners, we think we are neutrals who can analytically assess the data and come up with our, our, our theories all by ourselves. That's a very Western thing to think. Other people in other times and, and, and places have not thought in that way at all. Westerners are weird, and he coined the acronym WEIRD, Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic, W-E-I-R-D. We are weird. And he has absolutely no problem in saying the thing that makes Westerners weird is Christianity. And he says that not as a Christian. He says that as an evolutionary biologist who says we come from a place. We exist in a stream and we do not sit above that stream looking at the world. And he goes into how it is Christianity that has shaped Western values. And he, in particular, it's the, the Christian sexual ethic that has shaped the West. We might get into that in a little bit. But I don't think what I'm saying is controversial. I think it is challenging because it's a little bit like unconscious bias training. Hmm. Um, unconscious bias training wakes you up to the things that you're unaware of mostly and you know Im imagine you had an unconscious bias against australians i actually have and, conscious and somehow... bias against australia but, yeah. <laughs> you've devoted yourself to that bias you've <laughs> built, built it into you um every morning just hating australia a little bit more um <laughs> you know, but uh, imagine that sort of woven into the warp and woof of American culture, there was this disdain for Australia, you know, taught to you by the Simpsons. And that, that Australia episode is just a, a debacle. But anyway, um, maybe you have that, you know, um, but then that, that means, Carson, that you treat me in certain ways and you disdain what I say and you ignore me and, and you don't even know what you're doing as you do it. If someone else comes along and just says you have unconscious bias because of the American culture that you've grown up in. What they're trying to do is, is not arrogant and it's not imperialistic. It's, it's genuinely trying to wake you up to the forces that are at play. And you mentioned, Carson, that uh, a, a modern atheist might look at Christianity and, and call it regressive. And I guess all I want to do is, in, in this book, ask the question, why is being regressive bad? By what standard are we judging the church such that being progressive is a positive? And I do think that just studying the history of ideas, we'll come to see that it is the Jesus revolution that has taught us about the value of progress, which is the seventh of the, of the seven values that I talk about. But it's true with all these values. Um, I talk about um, equality, compassion, consent, enlightenment, science, freedom, and progress. Now, what's fascinating is when you reverse those values, you're talking about something that is unequal, cruel, coercive, anti-enlightenment, anti-science, restrictive, and regressive. Now, isn't that a pretty, isn't that a perfect description of how so many secular people think of 
Christianity today. If something is those seven negatives, that is the worst. Well, why is that the worst? Because those seven values are the best. The trouble is, those seven values are not obvious, they're not natural, they're not universal. They are particular to the Christian revolution. And I guess I need to, I need to beg people's indulgence and say, look, this is going to be challenging, because it's unconscious bias training is always challenging, but I, I want to show you that you are located within a history of ideas, and that history is a particularly Christian history. You might not like that, but hopefully we'll have some fun along the way. I'll tell some good stories. I will, I will own the ways in which the church is regressive and, and is terrible in all these senses as well. So I'll, I'll end up agreeing with you, my atheist friend, in so many ways. But come with me on the journey. And I'll, I think you'll see that I'm, I'm making uh, an historical case and hopefully not an imperialistic case. Right. I think just hearing your heart on that, and your heart's in the book too, but again, that helps to, to see how you're contextualizing the argument here. And it is interesting that the very charge I've brought is one that, again, kind of shows the thesis of your book in such clear relief. Um, so I want to just keep pushing on this line of thought, though. Let's say someone takes all that in in, in in the best way they can and, you know, appreciate you trying to do some unconscious bias training for me and my anti-Christianity, uh, but, you know, suspicions, because there is that bias against Christianity in many places. But at what point do you say, okay, this part of Western culture is not Christian? Uh, you know, they want science, they want freedom, but they've clearly rejected Jesus. They are trying to formulate their ethics from a different stance. At what point do you look at someone within the, the air of Christianity and acknowledge, all right, you're not being influenced by this stream? Mm. Um, I think it's very important to note that, you know, within the atmosphere, there is nitrogen as well as oxygen, as well as carbon dioxide, as well as many other trace gases. And I think, you know, Western culture is absolutely um, a mixture of all sorts of things. And I will find myself acting like uh, a Roman senator <laughs> at one stage or like... Um, a, a member of the hoi polloi going to the gladiatorial games and enjoying the blood sport, or I will find myself being quite stoical, or I will find myself believing in karma, or a, any any number of pre-Christian or non-Christian kind of ways of, of seeing the world. And that that is always um, part of the mix. We're, we are a very mixed bunch, and even me, as a Christian... I, I am constantly a swirl of different influences as much as I might want to be a consistent Christian. Um, so it's, it's important, like in, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, Jesus predicts the, the triumph of the Jesus revolution. It's, it's an extraordinary passage of scripture for, for this penniless preacher who is in some backwater of a long dead empire, basically saying, I'm going to take over the world and this is how it's going to happen. And he does that in, in Matthew 13 when he has not an ounce of earthly power whatsoever. Um, he talks about the, the word of his kingdom being like a seed and it's going to grow the largest, you know, the, the mustard seed grows the largest tree in the garden. Or he says, it, I'm, you know, my movement is like yeast that works its way through dough. In amongst um, those parables that Jesus gives in Matthew 13, he also says um, the, there, there's the seed that brings the wheats. There are also weeds in amongst that. And Western culture, like all cultures uh, in the world, uh, is a mixture of wheat and weed. And th th there's all sorts of, um, there are all sorts of non-Christian influences on me and on culture all the time. What's fascinating, though, is that we do tend to view them through uh, a distinctively Christian prism, mm. which is why I kind of think the the two, f my first two values that I look at, which is equality and compassion, um, they are unique to um, Christian civilization, certainly in the way in which we consider them today. They're unique to Christian civilization, and they are kind of foundational to the, the, the lenses through which we view every other value in society. So um, I'm, I'm all for saying we're a mixed bag. I'm all for saying our cultures are a mixed bag. But even as we look at Roman senators and gladiatorial games and stoicism and karma even as we look at those things we're looking at them 
through lenses that have been decisively shaped by the Jesus Revolution. So I, I would say that um, in the air that we breathe, um, the, the, the great majority of our moral intuitions are, are basically being shaped by Christianity. But you're absolutely right that there's, the, there's a mixed bag right, in there as helps. well. And I appreciate that you acknowledge that that mixed bag isn't just like in those people. It's in mm. me. It's in you. Mm. It's This is all of us are sorting out the different influences in our terms of our own opinions, our own preferences, our own uh, life stories, our own little micro cultures. We're all attempting to sort out what is true, what is good, what is beautiful, what's the purpose of life, how do I make sense of all of these different inputs. So uh, I don't know if you want to take one of those uh, two values. Um, again, you, you say equality and compassion, consent, enlightenment, mm -hmm. science, freedom, and progress. Those are the seven values you cover in the air we breathe. But if you could just take one of those values and, and give us, sketch out the argument for us, how does equality or compassion, whichever one you want to choose, how is it that your book's mm -hmm. thesis can be illustrated through one of those values? So this, the seven map onto sort of seven epochs. I talk about Old Testament, New Testament, early church, medieval period, scientific revolution, abolition of the slaves, and then on into the modern day. And so those are the seven epochs that I map those seven values onto. And I guess the second one, New Testament, the arrival of Christ in the flesh, um, that, that chapter is all about compassion. And I, I think... I probably would put compassion perhaps at the at the top of the hierarchy of values. Interestingly, I, I debated uh, a New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman, who is not not a fan of Christianity. Um, he he debates Christians um, very well <laughs> and and um, uh, does it a lot. And he's a New York Times bestseller. And and we we had a co a conversation about my book. Interestingly. The place we had most agreement on was on compassion. He said, no, absolutely. Um, there was obviously compassion in the Jewish scriptures, in the Old Testament, um, but within the Old Testament people of God, that is, that is kind of locked up in a single nation. What happens in the New Testament is that Israel bursts the banks um, of its national integrity to flood the world. And in Jesus in particular, the king of the Jews... The, the number one word to describe his emotional life mm. is compassionate. And so whatever happens, the, the leper comes towards him and Jesus, filled with compassion, reaches out and says, you, you will be clean. Um, his, his heart is, and, and, and the, the word compassion in the Greek, it's a, it's a word to do with your your, your It's very guts, visceral. Your, it's, um, very visceral. Um, it, in the old King James translation, bowels, right? Um Bowels of compassion, bowels of mercy, um, which it might gross you out until you realize that actually you don't really feel affection in your heart. Um, when you are really moved, either with love or with fear or with pity or with horror, it's your guts mm. that are grabbed. And this very strong word that is not really used of anyone else in the New Testament, it's uniquely used of of. Christ himself, and it is the number one way that Christ's emotional life is described. Gut-wrenching pity, this bowel-churning mercy that Jesus has. And, and famously, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, um, where a guy falls among thieves and he's left for dead. A priest comes by and passes by on the other side of the road. And then a Levite who helps the priest in the temple service, another, another religious guy, passes on by on the other side of the road and then the third guy who comes along is a samaritan a hated race a hated religion um most of the most of jesus hearers would have heard when they heard samaritan they would have heard enemy mm. an enemy comes and has compassion on the man and he's moved with this gut-wrenching pity and he he seems to have this sort of makeshift first aid kit that he does a bit of first aid to the guy and he puts him on his own donkey and takes him to the, like this makeshift hospitals kind of thing and pays for, for the guy's um, health and healing. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. And that was just absolutely revolutionary. Like if you, if you started off a story in the ancient world and you said there was some guy and he fell among thieves, 
like that would kind of be the end of the story. And the moral of the story is don't go down that road That's late at still night. That's the story. Parents don't be an idiot children. like that guy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It would just be the moral tale. It it would be an Aesop's fable, you know. Ancient culture was just full of Aesop's table fables, and they were cautionary tales. Just don't be an idiot like that guy. Um, and then maybe the story, if an ancient person was telling it, would go on about, um, you know, of of course the religious guys do the right thing in not becoming ceremonially ceremonially un- unclean, because in the ancient world, you've got a tragic view of life. It all ends in the grave. Know your place before you die. Don't get uppity. Don't, don't get ideas above your station. Accept the fates. There's nothing you can do about it. And in, in an ancient tale, may, maybe those religious guys would have been cast as not, not exactly heroes, but ex- at least exemplars. Because you don't know. You don't know whether the village wanted that guy dead. You don't know whether the gods wanted that guy dead. Who are you? Who are you to um, to cause an intervention into the affairs? Well, and of we should this defer to their world. authority. I mean, here are two authorities walking by. Their actions yeah. would show us the right way. Yeah. Right. Right. And the last person you would expect to learn from is going to be the Samaritan guy who is totally outside of the system, but he's this beautiful stranger who effects an intervention. And what's fascinating about the ancient world is the ancient world is a world of inequality, and and they would have thought rightfully so. You've got a very steep hierarchy of being, the gods at the top, the slaves at the bottom. And wisdom, in large part, consists in knowing your place. And so justice for an ancient means enforcing the inequalities that are woven into nature. Whereas Jesus comes along and he tells this story in, in which the, the, the enemy guy comes and picks up the dead guy, basically, and heals him and, and overturns the natural order. And what you get with, with Jesus is this compassion revolution that is not content with the status quo. Such that now, 2,000 years on, when we hear justice, we hear the opposite of what an ancient person thinks. An ancient person thinks justice is enforcing the inequalities of the hierarchy. We now think justice is leveling the playing field. And if, if nature has an inequality, we're going, we're going to equalize it. And we're, go, we're going to bring about that sort, of, that sort of revolution. And so when Jesus goes, goes and says... Go and do likewise. He's, he's doing a couple of things. He's saying, I, I'm the good Samaritan. I'm the one with the great compassion. I'm the one who stoops and serves and, and joins you because you are the guy left for dead. I come and stoop and serve and have compassion on you and raise you up. And then I say, go and do likewise. And there was an absolute revolution in compassion. But Ehrman absolutely um, attests to that. He says ancient cultures were dominance cultures. Suddenly, Christianity births the idea of service into the world. And you start to get orphanages. And you start to get hospitals, right? And you, and you, and you start to get charities. And suddenly, going to the bottom to serve the weakest is the greatest thing that you can do. And that's, that's an extraordinary thing for an ancient person to think, but it's exactly what you would think. If you have seen the highest, Jesus Christ, descend to the lowest in order that he can raise us up and invite us to his table. So the, comp- the compassion thing is, um, is absolutely radical, absolutely revolutionary, and we're, st- we're still feeling the reverberations yeah. of that today. So to pick that up, I mean, it feels like, I mean, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, many people who have never been to church have heard that story and that is even a story arc that we might find in pop culture or what have you, where an unexpected, you know, despised person actually turns out to be the hero of the story because of their moral character and the way in which they suffer to serve others. Uh, but, you know, it feels like, you know, you, you, there's this tension uh, in the way you put it just now between how Jesus inverted the value system of the ancient world. But even today, there is a way of doing ethics that says, uh, what we've learned from studying uh, nature in a scientific manner is survival of the fittest. And so our ethics should mirror what we found in nature. And so there is a selfishness is good, greed is good, uh, you know, um, the strong do 
beat the week. That's kind of how the definitions work. And, um, you know, it's, it's rarely stated in a crass manner, but it does motivate how people choose their careers and their lives and, you know, how they handle their money and so on and so forth, where they really are trying to maximize their own fitness. And if other people get trampled on along the way, too bad. Stand up for yourself better if you can. And so it's still challenging a very prominent theme, even in Western culture. And I mean, as we record this, uh, we are seeing that epic struggle between Russia and Ukraine, where it would seem that Putin is saying, look, I have a bigger army. I want this land. It's mine. And um, it's a survival of the fittest battle to see who will control that territory. Mm. So the the value of compassion yeah. is still... Yeah. Yeah. Um, marginalized in some ways today. And so could you, yeah. Oh, so yeah. Massive, connect the dots for us between yeah. the revolution Jesus started and the way in which it's still that mixture of we've got oxygen and nitrogen uh, in our culture today. Mm -hmm. Well, in a sense, the only real difference between Putin now and an ancient warlord um, is, is not really in the behavior of the Putin or the warlord back in the day. It's just that we have a category now for saying, uh -huh. you've broken the Geneva right. Convention. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a the Geneva what? Convention for Caesar. Like, you know, that's... Yeah, well, exactly, exactly. You know, now Aristotle, you know, had um, lists of just causes for war, but, I mean, like, listed among them were things like, um, you want some more slaves, <laughs> You you want you need more sex slaves for, to to get the economy to work right, um, so it's it's not that we behave better today, you know it's it's that um, what we now consider to be unconscionably evil, um, we have a category for whereas whereas Julius Caesar being Julius Caesar, he enslaved a million Gauls and he killed a million more. And that was that was his boast. That was what they were singing about him in his triumph through the streets of Rome. He's killed a million Gauls. He's enslaved a million more. And it's not that we've gotten better since Julius Caesar. It's just <laughs> that that tends less to be a boast, right? We we, we tend to frown on that yeah. these days, right? And and again, I was talking the other day to somebody about um, sexual abuse scandals and and. And it's it's not that we are better in the modern day. That there are still the Harvey Weinstein's and the Jeffrey Epstein's and, and and all the rest of it. But take those figures and put them back in Rome. And what what would you call a Jeffrey Epstein? You'd call him a senator, yeah. right? You'd call like. And there would be no there would be no sense of the wrong of what had happened. So it's yeah. So it's it's not that we have. I, I think morally become a, a better, kinder, more compassionate species. But it, but at least we, we have in Christ an exemplar of what to aim for. In the church, we have the Holy Spirit to help us live the life of Christ. That's true. But in, in the wider culture, it's, it's, it's less that we have, um, we have bettered ourselves morally over the last 2,000 years. It's, it's more about what are, the, what are the rules of the game? What are, what, are the, what are the transgressions? What are the boundaries that, that Putin is transgressing? And he, he has transgressed boundaries that we, that we consider to be sacrosanct. That's, that's the, the very different thing to the situation of a Julius Caesar Definitely. So all those years ago. So we look ago. at the sense? ethics um, and the way in which society is maintained in the ancient world, ancient Roman world, or other ancient societies that you go through their ethics in your book. And we, we see what you've just described. And then you see Jesus telling a story that overturns all of that and actually demonstrating it through his own sacrifice on the cross, his willingness to die for people yeah. who are his enemies. Yeah. Uh, and so that launches a revolution. And then we pick it up to the current headline news. And we see people using the Jesus standard to evaluate the behavior of the rich and the powerful today. And so if, if someone's listening to this and they're thinking, yes. yes, I use the compassion standard 
to evaluate people's lives and even evaluate my own life, then your argument is that's part of the air we breathe and you're breathing that air because of Jesus's life and teaching. Right, right. And you can get at it so viscerally by just saying, is Vladimir Putin wrong? <laughs> is he wrong with a capital W? And if so, why? On what basis? Because if you're just going to be a naturalist, you just believe in, in nature. Well, nature is red in tooth and claw, and na nature kind of unfolds according to the survival of the fittest and the sacrifice of the weakest. So why is it wrong? Why is it wrong for a bigger nation to swallow up a smaller nation if it wants to? Why? What is being violated in nature? There's nothing that's being violated in nature, and yet we think of it as a violation. We think of it very strongly as a violation. Many of us would give our lives for the, 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 the truth that there has been a violation of a sacred standard that, that Putin has overstepped. or what you know, um, And therefore, the, the question is not, are you a believer? But why do you have the beliefs that you have? Because you cannot, I, I really don't think you, you, you can um, credibly get from, we are the heirs of a brutal struggle for survival, mm -hmm. and Vladimir Putin is wrong. I think from the natural, we all have views that exist above the natural. And what do you call something that is above the natural? It is something that is supernatural. And what I want to say to my, my, my friends who are not Christians, is you already have beliefs. Those beliefs are supernatural beliefs. And we, ha we have them because of this unique individual. And you've got to meet this guy because he overturns the sacrifice, uh, the, the, the survival of the fittest, because he is, he is the fittest who is sacrificed for the weakest so that we, the weakest, might survive and not just survive but thrive and join his radical compassion revolution. Um, and so I, 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 I say in the book, look, you know, nobody needs to take a leap of faith. You, you really don't. You, you have these beliefs in the wrongness of Vladimir Putin, let's say, or the wrongness of Jeffrey Epstein. You, you, ha you have such a visceral sense that that might be the, the brightest pole star in the constellation of your moral values. Yeah. Jeffrey Epstein is wrong, right? right? Evil, wicked. Um, where do you get that from? And I, I just want to say that is not a natural value. It's a supernatural value. It has come to you through the Jesus revolution. And let me introduce you All to right, the guy. So let me push back one more you. time, maybe a few more times. But you said, mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, your, your book is arguing that these values are historically contingent. And here's the historical thesis that shows how it is that these weird values came to be so normal. But there's a contingency to them. And yet, at the same time, you were just saying that these values are, are supernatural. They're sacred. They stand above, you know, human society and, and nature. And so there's a, a tension there. Some people will say, okay, I, I, I value compassion. I will see the supernatural uh, reality that compassion points to in Jesus. But other people will say, no, Glenn, you've just shown me that what I thought was sacred what I thought was supernatural is just historically contingent. And let me explain how it works. Um, just as some genes uh, outcompete other genes, some memes outcompete other memes. And if you tell people that poor people are just as good as rich people, guess what? There's a lot more poor people in any society. And so a lot of poor people are going to go, that's a, an ethical system I'll buy into. You get a bunch of poor people saying, we demand equality with the rich. At some point, the, you know, the, the economic structure, the political structure has to accept that that's part of the fabric of society now because too many people believe they're equal to the rich and, and so on and so forth. And so um, your book is just showing us how contingent these values are, but we can safely discount them now that we see how idiosyncratic they are. <laughs> yeah, and that's kind of the nuclear option, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's it, um, there's there's a consistency to it. Um, you, you're kind of like, okay, it's it's 
Um, Yuval Noah Harari is is uh, a good case of someone who who kind of takes this view, and he says um, human rights are as fictional as the god they are based on, and. Yuval Noah Harari will agree with the argument of my book that we get human rights through the Jesus Revolution. He's got absolutely no question about that. Um, but then he takes things one step further, um, like what you're saying, so what? and saying, well, <laughs> um, if we are going... So what? So, so let's, get, let's get rid of those rights. Um, and let's, let's stop thinking in those, in those terms. It's, it's, it's clearly just a story we've told ourselves, and let's, let's move on from that. Um, well, in a, in a sense, there's there's very little I can do except show someone the the end game, really, of of where they want to go. And I think one one of the reasons why I wrote this book was in 2019, at the very end of 2019, I did a debate with Matt Dillahunty, um, who's a an atheist, anti theist YouTuber, uh, very successful at that. And we had a sit down on Justin Briley's show, Unbelievable. And we had a conversation in which he, he too, um, be- because he rejected Christianity, um, he too wanted to, object, uh, wanted to reject objective moral values. And Justin Briley, the host, and then myself, we sort of pushed him um, about what about the Nazis? What about if you could have a society in the 1930s, let's say, and you have some disabled people and the rest of your society can flourish and thrive if only you bump them off? Um, why wouldn't you? What's there to stop you? And, and Matt Dillahunty, I'll never forget him, saying, uh, well, at that stage, you've just got to look at the data. Um, I was like, the data? He's like, yeah, yeah, you've got to, you've got to look at you know, whether that population really would um it really is holding you back or whether maybe you know someone from that population might come up with a cure for cancer and justin briley said but what if what if they don't come up with a cure for cancer or produce wonderful works of art what if they just sit around and and just consume all the resources of society um and and then matt dillahunty said well yes um well at that stage you know they they don't have value they've got to prove their value as I said, Matt, can you can you say that again <laughs> for for the record? People don't have value; they've got to they've got to prove their their value. And he said, "Yes, absolutely." And there, you know, there comes a point at which you've just got to show people the abyss that they're hanging over, <laughs> um, and say, "Do you really want to go there?" I, I I do think that's that's quite a nuclear option. Uh, where I find most of uh, my friends being is right over on the other side where they absolutely outperform me at equality and compassion and all these values. They completely put me to shame in terms of their mercy and their love and their charitable giving and, and giving of themselves. Um, and they hold those truths to be self-evident, as Thomas Jefferson might say. Um, and they are already transcendent values in the lives of my friends. Um, and, and at that stage, they... They don't want to give up Christianity. They, they, they don't want to give up those values mm-hmm. um, lightly. Whereas I was giving a talk at a very posh school in England. Um, it's, you know, it's produced like a dozen prime ministers for, the, for, for Britain. And I was giving a talk on this book. And there was a, there was a guy there who was a 17-year-old. Um, just he was like six foot five he was good looking he just played in the cricket game and and scored a hundred runs which is like a a, you know a a pretty alpha male thing to do but he was incredibly erudite and intelligent and he came to my talk and and he was basically doing the Yuval Noah Harari thing he was basically doing the Matt Dillahunty thing and he was he was beaming as he did it and he was like well obviously human rights are as fictional as the christianity that gave rise to it and, and of course you know beauty is just neur- neuronal firings inside the brain and of course love is just a chemical reaction and he was just trading away all the all the values all all the all the transcendent values by which we navigate our lives he was trading them all away so cheaply and just and you and I just thought you haven't really suffered, have you? Um, you haven't lived very long, and everyone when they're seventeen goes through a, a, a kind of a luxury nihilist phase, don't they? Um, <laughs> but most most of my friends aren't there, and most of my friends demonstrate to me that they are believers. 
and th- and they're the ones I've really got front and center in my view. I want to show them you really believe this stuff, don't you? And you have absolutely no grounds for doing so. You you don't need to take a leap of faith. You're already midair. I need mm. to give you Jesus as some ground beneath your feet. That's yeah. usually and the I, way around. I think that's the, fair the, that, that their persuasion has its limits. And if someone wants nihilism and can afford nihilism, as you put it, a luxury nihilism, if they have the resources and the capacities mm. to uh, feel that nihilism works best for them, there's only so much we can offer there. Uh, but uh, I, do, I do appreciate that answer. So I think other people, Glenn, would say about your thesis, you know, Jesus did a good thing with the Good Samaritan story. And uh, love your neighbor, that's, that's a good one. I mean, that was a keeper. He nailed it on that one. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> blessed are the yeah, poor in yeah. spirit. I mean, I'm, I'm not 100% on that one, but I, I, I value some uh, modesty and some humility about that. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's some good, good stuff in there. But why go all the way back to Jesus? You know, I mean, he's, he lived a long time ago. He was constrained mm-hmm. by his context. Uh, he had limited access to information. He was pre-scientific. And so we can be inspired by him. And maybe we can pick up some good things from Buddha and uh, Gandhi and, and other heroic moral figures. But we're going to press ahead on, on the foundation he's laid and take it in new directions. So why do we have to go back to Jesus uh, mm. to get these values? Hmm. I think we've we've tried to secularize and anonymize the language around these values. So, in, uh, in instead of talking about the image of God in all people, we start to talk yeah. about inalienable human rights and that sort of thing. So we've we've very much secularized the language around it, uh, around these things, but the conceptual framework is either Christian. Or it crumbles, like really, um, and I, I think a Yuval Noah Harari kind of shows that. He's like, well, you know, if you cut me open, you will not find <laughs> human rights. You you will find organs and blood. You will you will not. Where where is this magical realm in which equality and compassion and human rights and dignity and worth? Where where is this realm in which these things exist? And I think on on purely naturalistic grounds, you simply don't get it. I mean. On equality, we are clever chimps who possess inviolable human rights. How does that work? You know, or, or on compassion, you know, we are biological survival machines and we must protect the weak. Like, wh- how, do, how does that actually work? Or on, on consent, you and me, baby, we ain't nothing but mammals. So let's protect one another's sexual boundaries at all times. How do, how do, like, tell me, tell me, like, I, I wonder, how, how does that work? Or in enlightenment, we are the heirs of a brutal evolutionary history, and we should further our aims only by persuasion and never by force. Tell me, tell me why. Or, you know, science, our brains evolved purely according to the, 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 the purpose of survival, and we can trust them to plumb the depths of the, the mysteries of the cosmos. Or on, on freedom, you know, um, it's survival of the fittest. That is the deepest explanation for our lives. <laughs> and having a master race is an unconscionable evil. How do, how do these things work? Or, or progress, you know, we are clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction, and things are going to get better. Um, like... <sighs> Show me where else to go. I think Christian Smith um, has written a great book called Atheist Overreach. And he makes the case that um, you can make a certain case for pro-social behavior on naturalistic grounds. But you cannot get to, you cannot get to human rights. You cannot get to compassion. You cannot get to the, the good stuff. The, the, the meekness and the humility that you were talking about. My goodness. How on earth do you get, how, how on earth do you get that on naturalistic grounds? Um, and so I, 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 I beg to differ, and and it's not, and it's not even as though you have to go back two thousand years. 
it is more like on the evolutionary model um you know the the next generation even even as uh, Yuval Noah Harari wants us to go from homo um homo sapien to homo deus you know the the next evolution um it's still um continuous with our development and like in a in a sense i'm not saying um we need to go back 2000 years in a sense i'm saying we just we need to be true to the living christ who is still working out his compassion revolution in this world he's still doing it very often it gets anonymized and it gets the language of it gets secularized but he is still at work the living christ by his spirit is still doing that so i'm i'm not saying let's abandon all the wonderful progress we've made up until the year 2022 and um go back to being bronze age i i am saying there has been there has been a developmental revolution a movement that is at work in this world that we ought to try to stay true to okay. let me, because let me we, when try we go another off way piste, of, we of go getting wrong. you to uh, excuse me of losing your audience um here so okay we're going to stay connected to uh jesus <laughs> and we're going to stay connected to the bible but let's look through christian history and you are very candid about hey the christians uh supported the crusades uh christians owned slaves christians uh, were colonialists. Um, Christians have done all kinds of evil and despicable things, and they're judged as that because of Jesus. And so, wouldn't you say that in today's world, uh, Christianity is getting it wrong on sexuality? That when it comes to gay rights and trans rights, uh, that that's another place where we can deepen our understanding of equality and compassion. And so instead of saying, hey, let's, let's just be inspired by it but go a different direction, what if we say we're going to stay connected to the tradition and here's some ways we want to move it forward? Do you see that as uh, enlightenment, as progress, as you know, making this world more the way Jesus wanted it to be? I think there are many things that the sexual revolution has taught us um, that are good and wise and helpful and you know i forget whether whether it made it into the final um version of the book but on my consent chapter i i note that um marital rape was only a crime on the statute books goodness in the states and in, in the uk in the 1970s it took until the 1970s for there to be even a category called marital rape how appalling when 1900 years earlier, the Apostle Paul put consent right at the heart of the married relationship, and you can read in, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, all about that. So, you like, have there been things that have been given to us mm -hmm. through the sexual revolution? Uh, yes, many, many things. Um, but is, is every revolution a good one? Is every re revolution an unalloyed good um, for society? And And I think you can look back and you can see, well, look, no, the French Revolution um, did its thing based on, you know, equality, fraternity, liberty. Those, those are all unimaginable kind of highest values aside from the Christian Revolution. And there's all sorts of Christianity that was informing the French Revolution. But my goodness, the, the, the reign of terror um, was something to behold. Again, communism... Um, the communist revolution um again communism is unimaginable without the book of acts <laughs> where, where the, the, this community of equals held all their goods in common and no nobody considered that anything was their own private property um and they you know it, it really was to each according to their need from each according to their ability um communism is kind of unimaginable without christianity but was the communist revolution you know in 1917 was that an un unalloyed good into the world chairman mao using his communist principles wanted to have a great leap forward and you know 40 plus million chinese yeah. died in his attempt at progress so scientific racism in the in the early 20th century <laughs> was that was, was that a positive so th th there's lots of there have been lots of people waving a banner for progress and um i think 
with a knowledge of just the 20th century, we, we, we should be very, um, we should be um, very reticent to give a free pass to anyone who says, I want, I want progress. Well, where? <laughs> where do you want to go? Um, and, and on what basis? And I think on, when it comes to the sexual revolution, there, there have been many things um, that have been good about it in terms of the equalization, especially of the genders. So um, I talk in the book about how in the first century, that's when um, the sexual revolution that has really shaped your world happened. It was about 1900 years before the swinging 60s. Joseph Heinrich, in that book that I mentioned earlier, he's, he's written about the weirdest people in the, in, in the world. We in the West have been shaped by that sexual revolution happening in the first few centuries AD in which there was an equalization of the sexes but the equalization that happened in the first sexual revolution um, under Christ's teaching was basically um, there'd always been a sexual double standard and men were, were always able to play the field and women were always expected to be prim and proper what happened in that first sexual revolution ah men are restricted men must be as chaste as women had always been expected to be and it was, it was an incredible sexual revolution. The historian Kyle Harper said, um, all, oh, he had such a great phrase, I'm trying to remember it. He said, um, um, all of humanity's inchoate um, erotic energies had to be cramped into one frail sacred union. That's, that's what happens in that first century um, sexual revolution. And yet it has been for the prosperity and the, and, the, uh, and the good of humanity in the most incredible way. And if you don't believe me, just go to evolutionary biologist Joseph Henrik and read his book. Um, that equalization kind of, kind of happened, and it, but it, it means something radical. It means the weaving together of man and woman in that sacred bond for life, that that is the one context for sex, and that outside of that union... We are to be chased. That's, that's a big call. But for 1900 years, that had absolutely been for the good of the world. Since the 1960s, we've had a, a kind of the mirror image sexual revolution in which the double standard was attacked in the opposite direction. And, and since the 1960s, and because of the pill, the contraception largely, women were able to be as, as liberated as men had always been in sex. And it has led to a, a whole bunch of different things. Some have been good, some haven't been. And I, I guess I just want to have a longer conversation with somebody about which aspects are good and which, which aren't. And if the conversation gets into, into the area of sexuality, I guess one of the things I would, I would do is point to the LGBTQIA++++. We're, we're meant to call it a community and I, I just want to—I just want to question: Is that a, a community, or is that a sign that we've fractured something that really needs attending to and, and unifying? And yeah, so I, I guess I guess not every revolution. Yeah, revolutions should not be given a free pass just because they're new, just because they're novel. That progress is not always in in the right direction. And at some point, like with the French Revolution or the Russian, Russian Revolution, there, there does come a point at which you want to assess the fruit of it and, and see whether, yeah. whether it's been an uh, And so uh, you would give that same scrutiny success. to um, purity culture uh, of American evangelicalism, uh, all of these different ways in which people are saying, here is right. you know, the vision for sexuality. Right. Uh, you want to scrutinize that and, and really ask a lot more detailed questions. Right. Does this connect to what Jesus taught and how Jesus lived because you know your belief is he's God and my belief is he's God and and so there's a goodness and an authority there that can give us wisdom for navigating these complex questions but what I don't hear you saying is yeah yeah, yeah. And what I don't want to what what I don't want to do is go back to the 1950s <laughs> like right <laughs> As, as though the nuclear family is is where it's all at. Actually, the the, the first century sexual revolution um, births a kind of a a, a multi generational, multi ethnic, wider family of gods um, that is a massive challenge yeah. to a nineteen fifty style focus on the family. Right? 
Um, so absolutely, I, I, I want to keep on bringing the challenge of Jesus and his revolution and that the church should be first in line uh, and to I, reform I don't hear itself you, um, according to the way of Jesus. Looking to us versus them dynamic in, in how you responded to that, um, you know, there isn't a hint that I detected of, of, of judging people or looking down on them uh, as if you've got the high ground here. Rather, uh, uh, what I was picking up on is a very conversational approach of respect of saying, okay, I see your thesis. Let's look at the details of it, and um, and together can we ask some questions about is the, which parts of this revolution really reflect the best parts of the Christian tradition, and which parts don't line up with that. I think so, and I, and I think you know if it's, when if it's voices outside. I think so, and I and I think you know even when even voices outside the church are also starting to question the sexual revolution of the, of the 1960s. It, it, it is pause for thought. I, I've just interviewed uh, a woman called Louise Perry, who is a British journalist uh, over here and a, a feminist. She writes for the New Statesman, uh, which is a publication very much on, on the left of UK politics. But she's just written a book, and I've just brought up the contents pages of her book that is called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And her chapter headings are Sex Must Be Taken Seriously, Women and men are different. Some desires are bad. Loveless sex is not empowering. Consent is not enough. Violence is not love. People are not products. Marriage is good. Um, and if we can find common ground yeah. on things like so that, I wanna, uh, take us we, to we the can end have of a really book fruitful where conversation. You write, we have a kind of semi-Christianity in the West, and it's enough to make us miserable. And so I wanted to ask if you could unpack that a little bit, because I thought that was a very interesting section of how you were hmm. wrapping things up in your book. It's based on a quote by Spurgeon. He was uh, applying it to an individual. He, sa he says, like a semi-Christianity, being only half a Christian is a miserable burden because um, I, I, I meet people like this all the time. They, they know enough to know stuff about yeah. the Sermon on the Mount, but they know nothing about the forgiveness of Christ. And so if all you know right. is the Sermon on the Mount, my goodness, what a miserable sinner you must be. You know, and what, how far short must you fall of the teachings of Jesus? And I think what we've got is like that with society. At a, at a corporate level, we've got a society that knows the teachings of Jesus, even if they've been taught to us anonymously, right. even, even if we've forgotten the Bible verses. We, we know the Bible verses. We've, we've forgotten the references. But it leads to a kind of a semi-Christianity in which those values just stand over us. And what mm. can values do? Values can never forgive you. They can only judge you. And... So what we have are actually a whole bunch of moral certainties in Western society. Hmm. We're kind of living like we are the kingdom without a king. And all we've got uh, are just these abstract values. But if all you've got is values, then you're going you're gonna to fall short. I'm going to fall short. What's the, what's the quickest way of feeling better about ourselves? Well, I'm going to point out your <laughs> failures. You're going to point out my failures. And we're going to rush to Twitter to tell the world. And and it's war, you know, and the culture mm. wars are just we're hurling Bible verses at each other. We've just forgotten the references. And I, I, I do think it's, it, it's a surprising development. Dostoevsky thought that, you know, without God, everything is, is permissible. Mm. And I think what we're noticing is that without God, everything's preachy, painfully preachy. And this is the semi-Christianity that we have in which we have Christian-ish values, but we don't have a Christ above them who embodies those values, and we don't have a forgiveness beneath those values that, that, that can give mercy to us when we fail. And what I really want to do is, is say to people, look, you, you love those things, but it doesn't really make sense unless you push through to the person of Jesus, who is compassion himself. Let me tell you who Jesus is. And I, I think that's, that's what really right. wins hearts, not the, the notion that I ought to be compassionate, <laughs> but the person who bled for sinners, he is compassion. You know, Titus chapter 3, verse 4 calls Jesus kindness. He is kindness with a capital K. When kindness appeared, he saved us, says Titus 3, verse 4. It's, it's, it's fascinating. It's beautiful. And in a sense, the whole book is an unpacking of that verse because kindness did appear in the world 2,000 years ago. And historically, I think I can make that case pretty convincingly. <laughs> Even Bart Ehrman agrees with me. Kindness appeared at a certain point in time. It happened 2,000 years ago. 
But then I want to say to Bart Ehrman, well, why did kindness appear? Well, maybe because kindness with a capital K, kindness covered over in skin, appeared. And I want to introduce him to people so that the kindness that you love is a, a pale imitation, a shadow of the reality that is found in Jesus. And it's a kindness that is for you. Values cannot forgive you when you fail them, and I am not the compassionate person I want to be. Nobody is. I need a person to forgive. Only persons can forgive. Values can't forgive you. But the one who is kindness promises to forgive you when you come to him in your weakness and say sorry. He promises to forgive you. And at that stage, you haven't gone from being an unbeliever to being a believer. You've, you've become a, a believer who now has somewhere to stand, and you, you become a believer who has been set on their feet by the forgiveness of Jesus. And now you can run along with with ground beneath your feet, with, with, with a context and a framework for the kind of goodness and truth and beauty that, that yeah, and I think you've you done resonate it very well. with already. I hope people that's, who've listened this far are going to say, okay, I've book. got to get this book and dive into all the details. Glenn, yeah. I do want to ask, let's say there's someone listening. They are so intrigued by Jesus. They <laughs> want to meet Jesus. The, the bridge is there. I mean, what would you say to someone who's like, okay, tell me who Jesus is and how I could know him? Because right, Jesus is just a word, very abstract, a lot of history here. Who is the person of Jesus? How could I begin to know him? Hmm. One of the inspirations for the book, among many, was Tom Holland, who's written a book called Dominion, in which he does the history of, Thank you. of Christianity. <laughs> he, he does it in about 650 pages, and I do it in about 200 pages. But um, it's beautifully, it's be <laughs> well, it's beautifully written, and I, I do I do commend Tom uh, Tom's book to, to people, um, and and I've gotten to talk to him a few times um, over the last few years, and he's come to a really interesting place in which he's acknowledged that you know human rights are entirely contingent on the Jesus thing, and he sees sort of the the modern liberal discourse hmm. as a pale imitation of the Christian story. And the phrase he uses is, I, I'm now surrendering to the story. And I, I, I love that phrase, surrendering to the story, and I'm happy to see the story as true, as the truest thing I know anyway. And so what does that, what does that mean? Um, I, th I think it would mean church for people. I think it would mean opening up the scriptures and, and hearing the story again. And the thing I recommend that people do in the book is to get acquainted with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these biographies of Jesus. And yeah. they are just, they're extraordinary literature above anything else. And as Peter Williams, uh, the Bible scholar, says, um, there's genius. There's genius in a story like the Good Samaritans, absolute genius. It's genius that's built civilizations. Now, where do you think that genius resides? Do you think that resides in Luke? <laughs> who wrote down that story you like when you look at who the disciples were they were idiots like do you really think the genius resides in them or are they basically reporting the genius who showed up 2000 years ago and who is kindness on legs and i just i i would just urge people to to get to know the jesus of the gospels and to to wonder whether he really is the embodiment of the good life whether he really is love covered over with flesh. And certainly that's, that's what happened to me at the, at the end of my university days. Um, there was a whole lot of philosophy going on and a whole lot of thinking, a whole lot of listening to the Blues Brothers, but um, there was also reading through the Gospels. And just, I, got, I remember getting halfway through Luke's Gospel. I don't know why Luke, but for some reason, halfway through Luke. And I just, the, the towering magnetism and charisma of Jesus and his stooping generosity and mercy. And I thought, if that's who God is, I'm in. And that's the journey I, I just encourage other people to go on. Just just keep pulling at, at that thread. Christ, you know, that, that figure on a cross has made your world. And I hope that the book will prove that. <laughs> and if you don't believe my book, believe Tom Holland's book, believe Joseph Henrik's book, <laughs> believe Bart Ehrman's book. Um, that man on a cross has made our world in that, in that sort of moral intuition sort of sense. But has he made the, our world because he is our maker? 
And is that ultimate reality, to see the fittest sacrificed for us the weakest so that we might survive, and to see mercy himself bleeding for his enemies? And you look at that and you think, is that ultimate? Is that tops? Is that, is that number one? Is that, is that what transcendence looks like? If, what a bizarre thing to think. But I think, I hope after the last hour of conversation, people start to realize, you know what, that man on a cross bleeding for his enemies, that is tops, that is transcendent. Well, <laughs> at that stage, you're saying Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and then, bad luck, you're a Christian. Thank you, know, you Glenn. <laughs> yes. Sneaks up on I, you. I love that. Just open That's up how it happens. the Bible. You can find it online. Google the Gospel of Luke, and Google will send you to a copy of it. You can be reading it uh, in 20 seconds. And uh, if you go to a local church and ask for a copy of the Bible, if it's a good church, they'll have a few copies they're willing to hand you immediately. Um, well, Glenn, I'm going to put a, a link to uh, your Twitter account and uh, your website for yeah. Speak Life and to your book in the description of this video so people can easily click over and find those. I uh, hope you'll consider getting the air we breathe and examining the claims for yourself. It's open for public scrutiny and challenge. Glenn's proven he is willing to take the hard questions and uh, and, and field them, I think, with kindness and thoughtfulness. And if you want to discuss this book in an international community of Christians, then the Uncommon Pursuit community is for you. It's totally free to join, and I'm going to put up a post where you can discuss this conversation and any questions you might have about the book and how it can be a bridge to conversation with your friends and your family. So thank you, Glenn, for joining us today. It has been so fun. Uh, my anti-Australian bias is gone, and I now uh, can respect Australians and people living in the UK. So you've made a number of impacts on me uh, in the past hour. Wow. And I uh, just, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, if you've watched this long, thank Amazing. you for your time and your attention. It's valuable. I hope you feel it's been amply rewarded, and we hope to see you next time.